Okay. So the last part of Pathogenesis that I want to talk about is probably the longest and potentially the most important. And this is what makes pathogens so bad. And that's virulence factors. Virulence is a measure of pathogenicity. The more virulent something is, the um, more pathogenic it is. And that can mean a bunch of different things. Something that is more virulent may be more contagious. Something that is more virulent may be more lethal. Something that is more virulent may be um, more likely to cause severe disease. Um, all of these things constitute virulence, right? Most bacteria don't infect humans and are not very virulent. A lot of opportunistic pathogens are also not very virulent. For instance, Staph epidermidis is technically an opportunistic pathogen. It, it can infect humans, but it's very not virulent. And uh, it lives on your skin, and it doesn't cause much issue most of the time. Unless you're pretty severely immunocompromised. Uh, whereas something like Staph aureus has a lot of virulence factors and can cause very severe disease. And not all strains of Staph aureus have the same virulence factors. And so the Staph aureus on you may be much more virulent and therefore uh, much more dangerous, much more likely to cause severe disease to kill you than the Staph aureus on me. Um, very little Staph aureus has all of the virulence factors that Staph aureus can have, thank God. Some of it is very common. Most strains of Staph aureus have it. Some of them are quite rare. Perhaps only a few percent of Staph aureus strains have them. And this is true not just for Staph aureus, but pretty much for everything that is a pathogen. Um, some of the strains will have more virulence factors than others, and those are the ones that you don't want to get. These virulence factors are usually genetic traits, and they are often, though not always, encoded for on plasmids. Um, I'm going to be talking about virulence factors in bacteria here. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to talk about virulence factors in viruses, since viruses are not, uh, viruses are never non-pathogenic, whereas bacteria often are. Uh, but there are things that we consider to be virulence factors in, in viruses, and I'm, I'm not asking you to know those things at this point. Um, so if we're talking about bacteria, like the least virulent, you know, might be things like lactobacilli and diphtherioids. These are things that live on your skin all the time. Um, diphtherioids can sometimes cause acne, and, and that's about the worst thing that they cause. Um, whereas, <clears throat> say, something like Pseudomonas arginosa is fairly virulent. Um, you know, it's gram-negative, it's endotoxic, uh, it's quite difficult for uh, both chemicals and the immune system to get rid of. Usually can have um, toxins, sometimes can have uh, capsules, things like that. Um, Yersinia pestis, plague, uh, is quite virulent. Uh, you know, up here at the top, uh, fortunately, it does not spread terribly easily. There are a number of different cat <coughs> categories of virulence factors. 
pertaining to different parts of infection. The first thing that a bacteria has to do to infect you is to get into you. So, um, some virulence factors make it easier for a bacteria to penetrate your barriers. Uh, there are some virulence factors that make it easier for bacteria to penetrate their, your skin. I'll cover those in a different category. Um, but uh, there are also most most bacteria get into you by penetrating your mucous membranes, and that doesn't just happen, right? So your mucous membranes are still a barrier, and the bacteria have to have some mechanism to get past them. It's easier than penetrating skin, but it's not trivial. Uh, so a um, virulence factor that might allow some bacteria to get inside of you is through directed uptake. And what this is, is that the, um, the pathogen will do something to the cells of the mucous membrane, causing them to, to, to endocytose it. Um, salmonella, actually uh, uses what's called a type 3 secretion system, which you can think of as a bacteria injection needle. They actually get up next to your cells and they inject a protein into them, and that protein causes the actin, which is the cytoskeleton of your uh, uh, epithelial cells to respond by rearranging and uh, forces them to take the salmonella inside, um, ruffling the membrane, which you can see kind of here. And the, the, the membrane, when it ruffles, it like takes, uh, it, it, it will like take in vesicles of stuff and the bacteria just make sure that it is one of the things that is being taken in. Uh, there are some bacteria that take advantage of what's called the malt system, which is, uh, the mucosa associated, um, lymphatic tissue. Uh, this is a tissue, it's actually a part of your immune system that is found underneath many mucous membranes, not all of them, but many of them. And uh, you want to be able to make antibodies in your mucus. And in order to do that, your immune system needs to know what bacteria are in your mucus so that it can make antibodies against them, right? Remember, this is IgA, that secretory antibody that is, is found at high abundance in the mucus. And so you have these, like, areas of lymphatic cells, um, B cells and T cells, uh, underneath and directly associated with your mucosa. And your mucosa has these cells embedded in it called M cells. And what the M cells do uh, is they sample what is going on inside of particularly your intestines. Uh, they'll take in particles from there, often bacteria. And the idea is that the uh, um, these are then passed to macrophages, and those macrophages will digest them and pass the information along to helper T-cells. And that's how your body gets to know and gets to make antibodies against things that are in your intestines. But some bacteria possess uh, special features that allow them to exploit this. So for instance, Shigella uh, can survive 
uh, being eaten by macrophages. So it wants the M cell to take it in and then pass it to a macrophage, and then inside the macrophage, uh, it will, um, uh, basically what it does is it prevents the fusion of the lysozyme with the phagosome, or the, the lysosome with the phagosome, so it never actually gets digested, and then the macrophage eventually just passes it out, undigested, into the tissues, where it then invades uh, cells of the mucosal lining. So it passes through the M cell, into the macrophage, through the macrophage, and then into the other cells of the mucous membrane where it infects them. Um, some cells, like for instance, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, intentionally get eaten by macrophages, alveolar macrophages in this case, and then just live inside of them. They have some way to prevent the macrophage or the dendritic cell or the whatever from digesting them. Enzymes. Um, there are a bunch of enzymes that bacteria have, obviously, uh, but I want to talk about two enzymes that kind of pair into uh, two other categories, but I wanted to break them out and talk to them about them here. Um, hyaluronidase and collagenase. So hyaluronic acid and collagen are two, um fibrous proteins slash uh, polysaccharides that give your skin its strength. Uh, collagen is actually found all throughout connective tissue, um, and uh, it's a major component of uh, the dermis layer of your skin. Uh, hyaluronic acid is... Um, a very important component of uh, uh, your epidermis and your dermis hold your skin together, basically. And um, hyaluronidase and collagenase are enzymes that digest them. So one of the things that makes your skin very a very good barrier is uh, the tight junctions between cells and the dense weave of collagen fibers right underneath the skin. Um, that's a very important thing that contributes, like the mortar in the bricks in the wall that is your skin, right? And these enzymes basically just chew their way through those. So instead of having to get in through an injury like a pre-existing uh, a pre-existing hole in the wall, it can just kind of splash the wall with acid and eat its own hole through your skin. These are usually going to be microscopic holes that don't bleed or anything like that. You may never even notice them, but the given time and motivation, the bacteria can, uh, can basically, as you see here, like secrete this enzyme that's going to chew uh, your skin cells apart and then get through and in to your deeper tissues. This is one of the few ways that bacteria can uh, get into your body through unbroken skin. Uh, another set of enzymes, uh, which you've probably heard of from lab, are coagulase and kinase. What coagulase does is it causes blood clots. And what kinase does, or at least what this kinase does, there are actually lots of different kinases that do lots of different things, but what this particular kinase does is it busts blood clots. Why would a bacteria want to clot your blood, right? 
I mean, I understand that clotting your blood is bad for you, but like, how does this advantage the bacteria? What happens is your immune system is constantly hunting bacteria down. You have your sentinel cells, your, uh, you know, monocytes and macrophages, and also your basophils and mast cells that are constantly looking for bacteria with their um, toll-like receptors. And if they find a bacteria, they're going to raise the alarm or they're going to eat it or something like that. This is something you want to avoid if you're a bacteria. So what the bacteria can do is um, secrete coagulase, which creates a clot surrounding the bacteria. So here you see the bacterium and the coagulase is going to cause this clot to form around them, which you can see here. Once they're inside of a clot, as far as your body is concerned, clots are like normal things to find. Clots just happen sometimes. You get little micro tears inside your blood vessel, or sometimes they happen spontaneously. So your sentinel cells aren't going to freak out if they see a clot. They go, ah, hey, there's a clot. I've seen one of those before. That's normal. And they just keep on going by. Well, inside of this clot, the bacteria multiplies. And so you might have just a couple of bacteria that got in, but then the bacteria are going to multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply inside of this clot until they reach a particular density, and then they make kinase, and kinase busts the clot, and all of the bacteria go spilling out into the body, except now there's much, much more of them. Uh, this helps a bacteria to establish a, uh, uh, an infectious population and to avoid the immune system because each of these bacteria is going to go out somewhere else and form another clot where it's going to hide and multiply and multiply and multiply. Um, so it allows the bacteria to like gather its forces and then spread out to different places and then gather its forces and then spread out from there into different places as well. And then begin this like exponential growth avoiding the immune system. Once a bacteria gets inside of your body, it now has to establish an infection. And, uh, you know, things like coagulase and kinase can help it do that by increasing its numbers. Um, but bacteria that just float around in the blood usually don't last for very long unless they've got something helping them, like blood clots. Uh, Generally, bacteria do best when they are attached to a surface and they can build up a concentration of cells, a whole population of cells, and they can actually start to outnumber uh, the local defense forces, right? So like if you're talking about any invader, they're not going to be very effective if you just have them spread throughout the place that they're invading. You want to like gather up your troops into nice dense units that can then go and actually accomplish things. Um, this is accomplished through adherence and colonization. Adherence is binding to a surface and colonization is growing in uh, into like a colony where you have a whole bunch of things that are all bound to a surface and are all together and are all protecting each other. Uh, adherence is usually accomplished by adhesins, which are proteins that let a bacteria stick to surfaces, usually your cells. There are a few different types of adhesion molecules. The most common ones 
are found at the ends of fimbria. This is one of the things that fimbriae do, if you recall back to when we were talking about bacterial features way in the early part of the course. We said that fimbriae were uh, adhesion agents and that they were virulence factors. And now we get to find out exactly what those are and how those work. So um, bacteria will have like fimbriae uh, coming off of them. And these fimbriae have little things at the end that allow them to grab onto your cells and stick to them. Sometimes this will induce uh, endocytosis and the, this can bring the bacteria inside of a cell, but often they just want to stick to the surface. Uh, Fimbria are not the only adhesins out there. Um, you can also find adhesins on capsules. Remember early on we said that capsules help the bacteria to stick to surfaces as well. Uh, and sometimes they can be on cell wall components. Usually, these adhesins are fairly specific. They don't stick to just any surface. They only stick to the surface where they want to infect. Usually, where they're going to have some other virulence factor which will help them deal with it or exploit it. Uh, colonization factors are anything that helps the bacteria grow into a larger force. Um, capsules are colonization factors. They help a colony stick together. And not only that, if you'll recall, capsules and slime layers are a very important feature of bacteria beginning to grow as biofilms. And the ability to grow as biofilms is definitely a virulence factor. Being a biofilm, uh, helps to protect you from the immune system, and it also helps to encourage uh, 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 you know, cooperative growth where the bacteria adopt different um, roles and specializations that help them to spread. Uh, you can have sideriophores that bind iron. Right? One of the things that your immune system does uh, to restrict bacterial growth is to bind iron. And that prevents the bacteria from being able to use the iron to grow. Uh, most bacteria require at least some amount of iron to grow and to reproduce. So if your body sequesters all that iron in a place where the bacteria can't get at it, it inhibits bacterial growth. If bacteria are going to grow into a colony, they have to have some way to get the iron. One way is just by binding it better. And so that's what sideria fours do. Um, you, if bacteria are growing in a colony that allows them to avoid IgA uh, in the mucosa, uh, because they kind of like can protect each other from being bound by this antibody, um, they can also like these pili uh, or uh, fimbriae are often going to be things that the antibodies bind to and something that they can do is just whenever an antibody binds to a fimbriae they might um, just shed that fimbriae. There's like an antibody binds to this thing here and it just cuts that off, cuts that off and that's going to get rid of the, uh, um, the antibody. Um, or you can have IgA proteases, which are going to be enzymes that come out and just destroy IgA. Toxins. As we've talked about before, there are two main categories of toxins, exotoxins and endotoxins. Exotoxins are things that are made intentionally by the bacteria or the pathogen and are usually exported through some sort of secretory system fairly constantly. Certainly while the pathogen is still alive and these exotoxins have specific functions, which I'll tell you about in a second. 
Uh, endotoxins, on the other hand, there's a little bit of dispute whether this is something that the bacteria intentionally make, or even whether intentionally is a word that makes sense for to talk about with bacteria. But um, endotoxins um, usually are only released upon cell death. We're specifically talking about gram-negative organisms, and they result in a massive inflammatory response. Uh, there's a greater variety of exotoxins than endotoxins. Uh, and there are four categories of tox exotoxins that I want you to know. The first is AB toxins. What you need to know about AB toxins is uh, they have two parts. The A part and the B part. So far, pretty easy. The A, or active part, A for active, uh, is the toxin. This is the thing that has a negative effect. It could have many different types of effects. Some of them are going to cause cells to secrete water. Uh, some of them are going to cause cells to um, induce apoptosis. Some of them are going to cause cells to phagocytize something. Um, but, uh, they're usually, like, the A part itself is not specific. The B part is the targeting component. So the A and B together, right, A is the payload and B is the targeting. And uh, the B is what's going to bind to specific host cells, usually not just any host cell. You don't want all of the host cells to start secreting water. You want, like, the host cells of the intestine to start secreting water in order to cause diarrhea, because that's what's going to get you out of the organism so you can spread to someone else or something else like that. Uh, and so that's how AB toxins work. Next category, membrane damaging toxins. As you might guess from the name, these are toxins that damage the membrane. Um, they're kind of sort of similar to the MAC or to perforins in that they're going to usually poke holes in membranes causing the cells to lyse. Uh, there's a few different reasons why bacteria may want to lyse cells. First off, we have Hemolysins, which you should be familiar with from lab, these are toxins that cause red blood cells to lice. This is usually done uh, to get nutrients for the bacteria. Remember how I said that bacteria have to get iron somehow, and one of the things your body does to like slow their growth is to prevent them from, uh, is to bind and sequester iron? Well, a way that they fight back is by lysing your red blood cells, and then absorbing the iron from them. Uh, also the proteins and the other bits. Uh, you have other membrane toxins like streptolysin O that insert into membranes and form pores. And these are things usually that bacteria are going to use to fight back against your immune system. All right? So... One of the things your immune system does to bacteria is, like, to secrete perforins and, you know, uh, the MAC attack complex um, to poke holes in bacteria. Well, the bacteria aren't just going to sit there and take it. Some bacteria have toxins that can do the same thing to your cells to kill your white blood cells um, and your other immune system cells. Um, phospholipases uh, can hydrolyze phospholipids in the membrane, basically just disintegrating the membrane. Alpha toxin of Clostridium perfringens, gas gangrene, uh, does this. And it's just another way of destroying tissue around it. Um, I think that in, in terms of alpha toxin, uh, it often does this to sort of destroy tissue because dead tissue doesn't 
have blood traveling through it, and therefore it does not mount an immune response. The third category is what are called super antigens. Uh, and what super antigens do is they induce what's called toxic shock. This would be exotoxic shock in this case. Uh, they basically cause a massive release of pro-inflammatory chemicals. Um, causing your body to suffer something fairly similar to anaphylactic shock. The mechanism is different because it's usually not mediated by histamine, and therefore you don't treat it typically with antihistamines. Um, but the results are very similar, right? You have massive uh, inflammatory response leading to full body like vasodilation, which causes a drop in blood pressure, and you have an evacuation of fluids from the blood into the tissues. Uh, and the way they do this is that the super antigen creates a false linkage between MHC2s and T cell receptors. Um, and so this means that you're activating a whole bunch of T cells that don't actually fight this pathogen. You're kind of like putting up chaff to confuse the immune system so that all of these uh, T cells are suddenly activated and they're running around, um, you know, uh, uh, potentially activating B cells or... Actually, this is used mostly for, um, there's another type of helper T cell that secretes cytokines. Um, and uh, now the immune response is just everywhere as opposed to being directed against the pathogen. Um, and so the immune system wastes its resources in a lot of areas where the cell, where the pathogen isn't. This massive cytokine release uh, results in what's called a cytokine storm, um, which we've basically talked about before. Um, and so here you can see, like, here we have a super antigen, which is going to cause a antigen-presenting cell to link up with a helper T cell, even when the, uh, the peptide isn't recognized, causing false signals. Uh, some organisms that have super antigens are uh, Staph aureus and Strep pyogenes, both of which can include, uh, can induce um, toxic shock syndrome. There's staphylococcal toxic shock, shock syndrome and streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. Both of those can be very deadly. The fourth category is other. These are, these are things, these are toxins that work through some mechanism other than the one that I've just told you about. Um, uh, the one that I want you to know from this category uh, is exfoliate, because it's going to relate to a disease that we study later on. And what exfoliatin does uh, this is found in some strains of Staph aureus uh, that cause scalded skin syndrome, and it destroys the material that binds skin layers together. And specifically, it destroys the material that binds your epidermis to your dermis, and the top layer of your skin peels off like you've been scalded. And so remember that top layer of your skin is the epidermis is what's making your skin waterproof, um, and when that peels off, uh, now the bacteria that was sitting there on top of your skin suddenly has a very easy way to get into the rest of your body, right? Because it peeled away the top layer of those defenses. Endotoxins 
um, we've talked about before, they act similar to super antigens um, in that they induce a massive inflammatory response. In a localized situation, this is actually helpful, right? Say you've got some um, gram-negative bacteria in a small wound area like around a cut. It isn't in your blood yet. Then that massive release of LPS is going to basically be a huge alarm. It's going to attract every white blood cell to that area where they're going to just descend and destroy those, uh, uh, those cells. The problem is once the endotoxin gets into your blood, now the immune response becomes systemic and this leads to endotoxic shock, uh, often called septic shock, endotoxic shock. It has um, symptoms very similar to anaphylactic shock or to exotoxic shock, although its mechanism is different. Um, the lipid A, the endotoxin of LT, uh, LPS, uh, actually works through um, the B cells rather than through the T cells or through histamine. But either way, it's going to result in a release of huge amounts of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, there are other things that can cause septic shock and sepsis, such as peptidoglycan components, um, bacterial flagella components, I think sometimes capsule components, um, though these cause less severe symptoms than uh, LPS usually does. So the last category of virulence toxins are things, or virulence factors, are things that allow the pathogen to avoid destruction. If you are going to be a successful disease, You've got to not die. That is the prime directive of any good pathogen is you can't all die. Um, and so you need something to protect you from the immune system. And there are a bunch of virulence factors that accomplish this. Uh, for example, so antiphagocytic factors. There are things that prevent your immune system from destroying pathogens through phagocytosis. Um, capsules, very common, both as camouflage, right? Um, Toll-like receptors often can't bind to specific things through capsules, and so your sentinel cells may not be able to recognize a, an encapsulated bacteria. Uh, but in addition, um, some capsules can bind regulatory proteins that inactivate C3B. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about this when we talked about the complement cascade that like your, uh, your cells bind factor D uh, that is going to yada, 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 eventually result in the alternate system not activating. Um, and like... Capsules can sometimes have things that bind factor D or that bind other things that inactivate C3B, preventing opsonization by the um, complement system. There are antiphagocytic chemicals that can stop the fusion of the phagosome with the lysosome, right? Meaning that... Uh, you know, the bacteria might be eaten by a phagocyte, but then never digested. And sometimes they'll just pass through the bacteria and then, or pass through the, the, the macrophage or whatever, and use this as a way to get into the tissue, as we talked about earlier with exploiting the malt. 
Um, or they may just live inside of the phagocyte. Uh, this is what uh, tuberculosis does. Like, it wants to get eaten, and then once it's eaten, it prevents its di own digestion and just lives inside of your macrophages, replicating and replicating and replicating, uh, eventually causing the macrophages to go out of control. Uh, that's how they hide out in there. Um, C5A peptidase. So some bacteria have an enzyme that destroys C5A. If you recall, C5A is a very potent chemoattractant, a uh, very potent chemokine, a thing that attracts white blood cells to the area of infection. If a bacteria has C5A peptidase, it degrades C5A, preventing your immune system from being able to target in on where it's located. Uh, M protein is a fun one. Uh, M, pro M protein is found in the cell wall of strep pyogenes, and uh, it is one of those things that I talked about that binds to regulatory proteins that inactivate C3B. So it prevents C3B uh, optimization. Right? So we know C3B is one of the main opsonins in your body. What's the other one? Antibodies. Antibodies are super, super important, and they're very, very potent opsonins as well as other things. Uh, some bacteria have what are called FC receptors. Now, if you recall, the antibody, right, has the constant region called FC, and the variable regions called F. A, B. And usually the variable regions bind to the bacteria and the constant regions stick out. And these constant regions are what are going to be recognized by, say, neutrophils as the opsonate, right? So your neutrophil is going to come up, it's going to recognize this FC, and it's going to go, ah, this is a bacteria, I should eat it. Similarly, this is the part that's going to bind to uh, C1 and start the classic complement cascade. It's this part that's going to um, attract uh, um, natural killer cells through uh, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Um, lots of things, right? So one of the things that bacteria will do is they have this FC receptor. Basically, they will bind the back of the antibody before the antibody has a chance to bind them. And since this FC is what's actually being recognized by your immune system, as long as the bacteria is covering that FC region, is binding to that FC region, your immune system can't get that signal. This is another uh, virulence factor found in Staph aureus and Strep pyogenes. This is by no means all of the virulence factors out there. There are a bunch of them. But these are the basic categories. We have um, things to help you get inside of the host. You have things to help you adhere, things to help you colonize. You have toxins, which increase lethality. And we have things to avoid the immune system. And these specific ones that I've talked about are the ones that I want you to be able to know and recognize.